The Theory of Knowledge and Islamic Perspective by Ayatollah Murtaza Mutahari. Chapter 9 An Examination of the Definitions of Truth and the Logic of Action. It is now the time for us to discuss the criterion for knowledge and its bases. Since in the previous session we talked about them somehow briefly in a bid to arrive at the conclusion, but we failed, we have no option but to repeat a bit what we have said. We have said that knowledge is of two types, correct and true knowledge, and incorrect and false knowledge. Generally, there is no dispute about it. Every group we consider classifies knowledge into two, correct knowledge and wrong knowledge. There are two issues here. Essentially, what is the meaning of being correct and true on one hand, and of being incorrect and wrong on the other hand? Our predecessors had only one way of determining them. They said, correct or true knowledge refers to the knowledge which is in conformity with reality, and incorrect or false knowledge refers to knowledge which is not in conformity with reality. Some modern scholars are of the opinion that according to this definition, it cannot be determined whether many pieces of knowledge are correct or not, true or false. They say that the definition must be changed. Instead of saying that true knowledge or correct knowledge is that which is in conformity with the reality and essence of a thing, we say that true or correct knowledge is that which is overwhelmingly accepted at a given time. Any knowledge which is accepted by the scholars of the time is true knowledge, and any knowledge which fails to gain acceptance is wrong knowledge of that time. Corollary to this is that certain knowledge about a thing may be true at a given time, and the same knowledge may be wrong at another time. For example, from the time of Ptolemy, the scholars had a consensus for about 2,000 years that the earth was the center and the sun revolved around earth. According to the above-mentioned definition, that was the true or correct knowledge for that period of two millennia. Now, for approximately 300 years, there has been a consensus, and this consensus is increasingly gaining wider acceptance that the sun is the center and the earth and other planets revolve around the sun. Thus, at this time, this theory is the truth, but this was not so according to the definition of our predecessors. As such, one was, is, and will be the truth, while the other was, is, and will be wrong. It is not the case that the Ptolemaic system was the truth at its time and the Copernican system became the truth afterward. This is not so. According to the opinion of our predecessors, anyone who is convinced by solid evidence that the sun is the center around which the earth revolves must say this. During those 2,000 years, all scholars were mistaken, and what they said was not the truth, but was purely wrong. The similarity between consensus according to the Ahl al-Sunnah and Auguste Comte's view. Auguste Comte's view on the definition of truth, to which Felician Shalai also subscribes, is similar in the Muslim world to the theory of Sunni jurisprudence on consensus. Of course, I am digressing in the middle of my talk, but mentioning it is not without any use. Both Sunni and Shia ulama recognize consensus as credible, but the Shia recognize consensus as credible in one way, while the Sunnis do so in another way. The Ahl Sunnah say that basically, the consensus of their ulama in a sense is valid. That is, if at a certain time all Muslim scholars agree upon an opinion on an issue in jurisprudence that a certain thing, for example, is lawful, halal, that thing is lawful based on the fact that the ulama have a consensus of opinion on it. They argue that the saying of the Prophet that my community or ummah will not agree together on what is wrong, which they themselves narrated, means that whenever my community has a consensus, whatever they agree upon is the truth. And if at another time the Muslim scholars have consensus of opinion which is contrary to an earlier consensus of opinion, again the truth is the second. If the ulama of the first century had consensus of opinion on an issue, their view was the truth. 
if the ulama of the second century unanimously agreed on a view which was contrary to the consensus of opinion of the ulama of the previous century, their view was also the truth in their own time. So the decree of God in the first century was one thing and another thing in the second century, and yet another thing in the succeeding century. The ulama in usul al-fiqh technically called this view taswib, and those ulama as musawwaba. The Shia, however, reject this view. They say that the ulama can only discover God's decree, which cannot be abrogated by the consensus of opinion of the ulama in a certain period. Assuming that the ulama of the 13th century have a consensus of opinion that a certain thing is lawful, and the ulama of the 14th century say that a certain thing declared unlawful by the ulama of the earlier century is lawful, the decree of God is either of the two. Either the former or the latter was mistaken. For this reason, the Shia basically do not give credence to the consensus of opinion of ulama of any period unless this opinion can be traced back to an infallible imam. Unless it is traceable back to an infallible imam, consensus has no validity. Rejection of Auguste Comte's View The view of Auguste Comte, Felician Shalai, and others on knowledge, that is, the meaning of true knowledge, is similar to the view of Sunni Musawwaba ulama. Just as the view of this group of Sunni ulama in this regard is an incorrect view in our opinion, the view of Auguste Comte in this regard is equally wrong. You may possibly ask, what is your basis in saying that Auguste Comte's view is not correct? Perhaps for 2,000 years the truth was that the sun was revolving around the earth, and now for 300 years the truth is that earth revolves around the sun. The answer is that truth cannot be changed by acceptation. Auguste Comte failed to realize that truth does not depend on our acceptation. Thought, idea, and knowledge have an essential characteristic and this essential characteristic is that it tells a story of what is beyond itself, reality. If I have such a thought that it is the month of day, now and not Bahman, this thought or idea of mine says something about reality. This question is always in my mind. Are these thoughts or ideas of mine in conformity with reality? Now, you may change the name, but the question will always remain in my mind. I say that reality does not have two forms. It is not true that prior to the past 300 years, the earth was really stationary and the sun was revolving around it, and that for the past 300 years, the sun was located somewhere and the earth has been revolving around it. I know that since the existence of the sun and the earth, either the earth has been at the center while the sun has been revolving around it, or vice versa. That I say today that the earth revolves around the sun is a thought. That someone would say before that the sun revolves around the earth is also a thought. His thought wants to express something about reality. Similarly, my thought wants to express something about reality. Therefore, one is in conformity with reality and the other is not. By acceptation, one cannot change the truth and say, I define the truth in this way. Is it optional for you to be able to define the truth in a certain way? No matter how you want to define the truth, the aforesaid question will remain in its place. This point can be said regarding emotions and laws, but not regarding knowledge and the truth, as they erroneously have done. Many legal issues may be dependent on the feelings and demands of people. That is, they tend to be dependent on the people at present. What does it mean? For example, an overwhelmingly majority of the people at a given time have a demand about social issues. This demand generates a right for them. Now, if after a hundred years the people's demand changes, that is, instead of that demand, they demand another thing, again, their right is what they demand anew. For example, let us assume that one day the people themselves want a sort of totalitarian regime. Since the people themselves want it, it is their right to be given what they want. After a century, all of the people's ideas have changed. That is, instead of totalitarianism, they want constitutionalism. This is a legal issue which depends on the people's will. The will of the people does not say anything about an external reality. 
As such, any change in it is inconsequential to the external reality. Yet, a thought says something about an external reality. Basically, man is a realist in the sense that his thought bespeaks of reality. Therefore, we will still have to seek the truth and reality. So this definition of the truth is wrong. Rejection of the Relativity of Truth Certain individuals said that to be true and to be false are both relative. It is possible that some people view a certain reality in different ways and, at the same time, they are all true. It is possible that this space seems big for me but small in your opinion. From here, if we go to another hall and I will be asked whether or not this hall is bigger than the Tawheed Center, I may say that the Tawheed Center is bigger, but if the center seems small to you, you may say that the said hall is bigger. In my opinion, this center is big, and in your opinion, it is small. Man is like that. If he comes from a big space and goes to a small one, the latter seems smaller for him. Or, for example, when one sees a person along with a shorter companion, it seems to him that the said person is a tall fellow. Another day, he sees the same person along with a taller companion, and it seems to him that the said person is a short fellow. He will say that the previous day, that person seemed tall, but today, the same person seems short. They say that both cases are true. Under the former circumstances, the truth was that he is tall, and under the latter circumstances, the truth is that he is short. If your hand is warm and you immerse it in lukewarm water, the lukewarm water seems cold for you. This is true. If your hand is cold and you immerse it in lukewarm water, the lukewarm water seems warm for you. The said water is both warm and cold for you. There is no objection to opposing views. The truth is relative. This and that are both true. This is also a wrong definition. Why? It is because, as I have said, it implies that these two ideas are both true in their respective narrations of reality, then it is wrong because the truth has only one form. Either this one is true or that one, or none of them is true. They cannot be both true. We cannot change the situation by playing with words and say that by truth I mean such and such. Granted that you say by truth I mean such and such a thing. Yet, every person has been created essentially as a realist. He has been created as a realistic and truth-seeking individual. He wants to know the value of certain emotions according to the presentation of reality. The Origin of This Error Let us see and find out the origin of this error. We have water at a temperature of 20 degrees. That is, it shows that the temperature is 20 degrees. I immerse my right hand in water at a temperature of 80 degrees and my left hand in the water at a temperature of 0 degrees. After my right hand gets warm and my left hand gets cold, I immerse my both hands in water which has a temperature of 20 degrees. My right hand feels that this water is cold while my left hand feels that this water is warm. They say that both are true. A realistic person would say no, it is not so. The heat energy of water has a specific limit which is shown by temperature. When I immerse my warm hand due to my earlier impression, I think that the temperature of this water is 10 degrees, for example. And by putting in my other hand, I think that it has a temperature of 30 degrees, for example. Both are wrong. What is correct is the same 20 degrees. The fact of the matter is that my mistake lies in thinking that I can feel the water while the truth is that I cannot feel it at all. What I can feel is the effect on my nerves. After my hand was immersed in hot water, my nerves were in a certain state. Then this water produced an effect on them and had a specific effect at a specified degree. My other hand, which was immersed in cold water, was affected in a different way, in a 20 degree temperature water. My sense or sensory perceptions cannot perceive the water. What is perceived is the reactionary quality within me. My sensory perceptions tell the truth, not in the sense that they present the water, but rather in the sense that they indicate their state. They tell the truth that they are in such a state. I was wrong in thinking that they indicate that the water is in such state. They do not indicate that the water is in such a state, 
but what they indicate is what state I'm in. They tell the truth in saying that I feel warm. That is, I feel warm within me. My mistake is thinking that they indicate that the water is such, and then I declare that both are correct, that the water is at this degree as well as at that degree. It is not so. The water has only one state at any given time. Let us pass by these theories on the basis of knowledge, that is, on the correctness or truthfulness of knowledge, on one hand, and its incorrectness or falsity on the other. That is, there is no point in discussing them more than this, otherwise there are still issues relevant to it. The difference between the basis of knowledge and the criterion for knowledge. Let us embark on the second issue which is more important, that is, the criterion for knowledge. How does this issue differ with that of the basis of knowledge? Regarding the basis of knowledge, we actually want to arrive at the definition of true knowledge, or to know what the true knowledge is. One said that true knowledge is that which is in conformity with reality. Another person said that true knowledge is that which is agreed upon by all. Yet another person said that true knowledge is a relative matter. Other definitions have also been presented. After accepting that true knowledge is that which is in conformity with reality, we shall embark on its criterion, that is, through what means we could know that our knowledge is true. The first discussion was about true knowledge and what it is, and the second is about the way through which we could know that a piece of knowledge is true. With the assumption that we know what true is, we ask, for example, what is gold? Gold is defined to us by saying that gold is a metal with such and such color and characteristics and properties. But once we ask, if I could see a metal with the same color you have said, and I do not know whether it is pure gold or not, whether it is indeed gold or just golden, through what means could I know that it is gold? Is there any such means? We say yes, there are criteria through which you could know whether it is gold or not. Thus, whether or not that thing is gold is one issue, and what the criterion is for knowing something is gold, whether it is real gold or not, is another issue. You say that true knowledge is that which is in conformity with reality. How could I know that my knowledge is in conformity with reality? I may have knowledge of an issue, and you may have a different knowledge of it. With which criterion can we assess that my knowledge is true while yours is not, or vice versa? This is one of the most important questions in logic. I can say that for the past 2,000 years, one theory was advanced in this regard, but later, another theory emerged, and nowadays, the second theory is in deadlock, and the trend is the return to the first theory. Knowledge of the Criterion Itself I am compelled here to mention some technical terms in logic. We have the system of logic, which is sometimes called rational logic, syllogistic logic, or Aristotelian logic. This system of logic has been founded since time immemorial on a fundamental whose corollary is that the criterion for knowledge is knowledge itself. That is, knowledge itself is the criterion for knowledge. That is, a piece of knowledge is the criterion for another piece of knowledge. If we ask, when a piece of knowledge serves as a criterion for another piece of knowledge, through what means could we obtain the very knowledge of the criterion? We will be told that the said knowledge of the criterion may also be obtained through another piece of knowledge, but in the end, man will acquire pieces of knowledge that do not require any criterion. Without any criterion, their validity has been guaranteed. This is exactly one of the central issues of the said system of logic which is called Aristotelian logic, rational logic, or syllogistic logic. This logic commences with the following words. Thought, that is knowledge, is of two types, conception, tasawwur, and assent, or tasdiq. Both conception and assent, each of the two types of knowledge, is further divided into two. Evident, badihi, and speculative, nazari. Evident knowledge is that which is not in need of any criterion. It is guaranteed even without any criterion. Evident assent knowledge is that which involves a judgment, and its validity is guaranteed without any criterion. This logic takes thought as the criterion for a view. 
Naturally, at least one question is raised by everybody here. How come some thoughts or pieces of knowledge are in need of a criterion, while others are not? That is, we will come to the point when we will say that this knowledge is no longer in need of any criterion or proof. In this case, what it approximately implies is this. Some pieces of knowledge are in need of proof, and since the proof itself is also a piece of knowledge, it may need another proof, and the second proof is also a piece of knowledge, and it may need yet another proof. It may continue up to some more phrases, but in the end it will reach a point wherein the proof itself is a piece of knowledge that does not need any criterion. For example, mathematics, arithmetic or geometry, begins with a set of principles, some of which are called given principles. Given principles means that knowledge which is not in need of any criterion. It is the criterion of itself. It is the criterion itself. A given principle means knowledge of the criterion itself. Some other principles are called principles of the subject. That is, it is in need of a criterion, but for the meantime, the students have to accept it so that its criterion could be presented to them in due time. For instance, the following is considered a given example. Two things equal to a third thing are equal to each other. Now, you want to know, for example, whether the angle of A is equal to the angle of B or not. Along this line, you have to know which angles are equal to the angle of A. You come to know that the angle of A is equal to the angle of C. Similarly, you observe that the angle of B is equal to the angle of C. As you learn these facts, or these two facts, you say that two things equal to a third thing are equal to each other. And this is a given principle. It is self-evident. It needs no proof. That A is equal to C, or B is equal to C, requires an evidence or proof. It needs to be proved. But this, that A and B are equal, does not need to be proven anymore. It is the criterion itself. It is self-evident. It is indisputable. The system of logic, which is likewise known as rational or syllogistic logic, states that all sciences and pieces of knowledge in the world must finally end up in the pieces of knowledge which are the criteria themselves. It is said that even empirical knowledge is anchored in pieces of knowledge which are criteria themselves. Aristotelian Logic on Experience Some have imagined that Aristotelian logic is not an empirical logic. This is a serious mistake. Its proof is all the books on Aristotelian logic, such as the books of Abu Ali ibn Sina, whose logic is Aristotelian, although he made a lot of improvements to Aristotelian logic. His foundation is Aristotelian logic. Aristotelian logic is empirical. That is, it gives special value to experience. Other systems of logic are different from Aristotelian logic, not in the sense that the former takes experience into account, while the latter does not. The difference, rather, is that according to Aristotelian logic, experience is also confirmed through the criteria for knowledge, an issue which we shall also tackle. Thus, the foundation of that logic, which is called rational logic, is that knowledge is the criterion for knowledge, and among our pieces of knowledge, we will finally arrive at pieces of knowledge which are criteria themselves and are no longer in need of any criterion. And in proving it, they said that if every piece of knowledge is in need of a criterion, we have to look for it. That criterion is also in need of a criterion. The third criterion is also in need of another criterion. So, in the end, nothing can be known. That is, we have followed the course of the skeptics and we have become absolute skeptics. Hence, no knowledge will exist in the world. It has been 350 years, that is, from the time of Francis Bacon onward, since another view contrary to Aristotelian logic emerged. According to this view, every piece of knowledge requires a criterion, and we do not have knowledge, which is a criterion itself. We ask, in your opinion, what is the criterion for knowledge? They say, the criterion for some knowledge is knowledge, but in the end, the criterion for knowledge is not another knowledge, it is action. That is, the ultimate criterion for knowledge is action. So, this foundation of Aristotelian logic, according to them, is wrong. This is the severe blow they thought they had given 300 years ago to rational logic, syllogistic logic, 
or Aristotelian logic. Yet, it is wrong for us to say that Aristotelian logic was syllogistic and not empirical, and logic from Bacon onward was empirical and not syllogistic. It is true that the more recent systems of logic place more emphasis on experience, but this is not true in the sense that Aristotelian logic gives credence to syllogism, while empirical logic gives credence to an experience. This is not so. The truth is that Aristotelian logic gives credence to both syllogism and experience. Also, the systems of logic which allegedly give credence to experience only cannot dismiss syllogism. In the end, they also have to give credence to syllogism. The Criterion for Knowledge According to Modern Logic The fundamental difference between the classical Aristotelian logic and the modern logic of Francis Bacon and others after him, which continues up to now, is in the criterion for knowledge. This view has gained acceptance in the world. They say, what is this claim that knowledge can be known through knowledge? Aristotelian logic states that knowledge is of two types, evident and speculative. Speculative means that it is unknown. One must think about it. It needs a criterion. It needs proof. Evident means that it is a criterion itself. We assess speculative knowledge which requires a criterion with evident knowledge which is the criterion itself. They continue thus, This proposition of Aristotelian logic is incorrect. All our knowledge is speculative, they say. All are in need of a basis and criterion. We do not have such evident knowledge. What is the basis then? The basis, they say, is action. It is here that for the first time in the views of philosophers, action as a criterion was given special value. They say that when man wants to formulate a real or true idea whose correctness or truthfulness he could discover through the basis of action, he has to do the following. First, he has to conduct inductive studies, because without doing them, no inspiration will come to mind. He has to study a subject closely. For example, a social, environmental, or medical subject. If a person wants to know how tuberculosis comes into being and how it can be treated, he has to examine tuberculosis patients, gather data, and get to know the causes. As a result of inductive studies, his mind becomes ready to formulate a hypothesis. In the mind of the scholar, a hypothesis crops up that the cause of tuberculosis is such and such, like in the case of cancer, it is hypothesized that smoking is a cause of cancer. This is an idea, and every idea is in need of a criterion. Its criterion is action. Then, the hypothesis is tested into practice. If the experiment regarding the cause of the ailment is not done on a human being, it is conducted on a mouse, for example. If it yields a positive result, then this idea is correct, and if it does not, then it is wrong. An example is societal problems. We have a concern in society called traffic management. Let us assume that a certain number of individuals are invited and asked how they could solve the traffic problem. Each of them sketches a plan or design. Which design is correct? We do not know which design is correct. What is the way of knowing which design is correct and which design is wrong? It is praxis. We implement each design for a certain period of time. If it yields good results, then it is correct, and if it does not, then it is wrong. It is here that the theory that is rational, syllogistic, or Aristotelian logic was considered rejected in the world for at least 300 years. The Impact of the Logic of Action Upon Religious Beliefs One of the problems brought by this system of logic was upon spiritual matters and religious issues, that is, upon issues which cannot be tested in practice. For example, if we want to assess on the basis of Aristotelian logic the statement of someone who hypothesizes the existence of the soul by saying, apart from this body and physical dimensions, man has an essence which gives him consciousness of himself and the world, we may possibly ask, what is your basis? He has to present a proof which is also a piece of knowledge, and if that proof is in need of another proof, he has to present a proof for it until he reaches pieces of knowledge which are criteria themselves. And then we would say, it is accepted. Or, a person says, the universe has a creator. It is a speculative idea. 
It is a piece of knowledge that requires a criterion. We ask him, what is the proof that the universe has a creator? He presents his proof. For this proof, he brings out another proof, so to arrive, in the end, at ideas which are criteria themselves. And the investigation comes to an end. But if we say that only through the criterion of knowledge that we can assess the truthfulness of an idea, what should we say regarding this type of idea? We cannot examine this type of idea in practice, say in a laboratory. Let us go and see if there we can find God or not. If we can see anything in the laboratory and say this is God, then that God is not God, because if there is anything in the laboratory, it is a dependent creature like any other creature. Some who are more objective have said that when the only criterion for knowledge is action and we have pieces of knowledge that cannot be known in practice, whether they are correct or not, simply because they cannot be tested, we have to say, we do not know. It was this idea that emerged in Europe, that whenever man has no answer to spiritual and religious questions, he would say, I do not know. Today's science says that the criterion for both true knowledge and wrong knowledge is action. If it is in conformity with practice, it is correct. And if it does not, it is incorrect. So, regarding the kind of hypothesis which cannot be put into practice and cannot be known whether it is such or not, that is, action cannot be its criterion, we have to say, we do not know. Some others have gone further saying, anything that can be tested in action or can be determined by the litmus test of action is true, and anything which cannot be determined by the litmus test of action, even if action does not negate it, is false. The materialist's argument is that when action does not confirm an idea, we say that it is false. And sometimes the non-confirmation by action is in the sense that action confirms the idea's opposite. And at other times, it is in the sense that action neither confirms nor denies it. Objections to the Logic of Action The proponents of the rational, syllogistic, or Aristotelian logic have proofs to reject these individuals' theory. And fortunately, today, some of these proofs and ideas have been discussed again. And from one perspective, it can be said that they have been discussed in a more lucid manner. Of course, it is not in support of Aristotelian logic, but in the sense that this modern logic is no longer universally acceptable. When this system of logic is also unacceptable, no other logic will remain for man. What are these proofs? They say, you say that only action is the basis and criterion for knowledge. We shall examine a piece of knowledge by means of action. If this piece of knowledge is true, it would yield a positive result in practice, and if it is not, it would yield a negative result. So, since it yields a positive result, it is true. They further say, you did not realize that this very notion that action is the criterion for knowledge is an idea. That is, it is a piece of knowledge itself. You yourself are thinking like Aristotelian without knowing it. That you say action is the criterion for knowledge means that, if this hypothesis is correct, it would yield a result in practice. It yielded a result, therefore it is correct. It did not yield a result, therefore it is incorrect. This in itself is an Aristotelian syllogism, a piece of knowledge. You took it as the criterion. Again, here, action-dependent knowledge is taken as the criterion. One may possibly ask, how could the truthfulness or untruthfulness of the very thought be known when you say that, if this hypothesis is true, it would yield a certain result, and since it yielded that result in practice, it follows that it is correct? This is itself a piece of knowledge which requires a criterion. You say that there is always a relationship between true knowledge and yielding a practical result. This very proposition, there is always a relationship between knowledge and action, is a piece of knowledge in the universe. How did this knowledge become true? This knowledge that there is a relationship between knowledge and action may be totally incorrect. A piece of knowledge may be true but yields no result in practice, and another piece of knowledge may be false but yields a positive result in practice. With which criterion can you prove this? You cannot say, I can also prove it in practice. In the end, you will say, this is already evident. That is, you again arrived at the knowledge which is the criterion itself, 
the same point at which the Aristotelians arrived. Third objection. This objection is more serious, and Russell is also aware of it. That is, the knowledge in your saying that the criterion is action is essentially wrong. This is itself considered a piece of knowledge which is criterion itself within Aristotelian logic. Why? This is because you say, if the knowledge is correct, it would yield a result in practice. Russell says, I accept this. Then you say, since it yielded a result in practice, it is therefore correct. This statement is wrong, however. The statement, if the knowledge is correct, it would yield a result in practice, is correct. But the statement, if it yields a result in practice, it follows that it is correct, is not correct. Why? In the parlance of the logicians, it is called the universal imperative. For example, from the statement, if this object is a walnut, then it is round. Four forms of conclusion can be arrived at, or one can think of the four forms. If it is a walnut, it is round, although it is a walnut. The conclusion is, therefore, it is a walnut, which is a correct conclusion. The second form is for us to say, although it is round, and to conclude, therefore, it is a walnut, is a wrong conclusion. The third form is for us to say, although it is not a walnut, and to conclude, therefore, it is not round, which is wrong. And the fourth form is for us to say, although it is not round, and to conclude, therefore, it is not a walnut, which is correct. That is, we can conclude in four forms. If we regard a thing as attached and say, if A, then B, it leads to any of four possibilities. Number one, it is A, therefore it is B as well. This is correct. Number two, it is B, therefore it is A as well. This is wrong. Number three, it is not A, therefore it is not B. This is wrong. And number four, it is not B, therefore it is not A, which is correct. Now, you say, if an idea or a piece of knowledge is true, it must yield a result in practice. Presently, I accept it. Then, you say, since it yielded a result in practice, it is true. This is like saying, if an object is a walnut, therefore it is round, and then saying, since it is round, therefore it is a walnut. This is not so. Every walnut is round, but every round object is not a walnut. That is, proving the first necessarily means proving the second, but proving the second does not necessarily mean proving the first. Negating the first does not necessarily mean negating the second, but negating the second necessarily means negating the first. It is here that the logic of action faces problems. What Russell says about the logic of action. In this regard, Russell has interesting words saying, you say the hypothesis is correct because it has yielded result in practice. The statement is logical if you can prove that there is no other hypothesis or hypotheses here that is correct in practice. That is, there are possibly some hypotheses, one of which is a hypothesis, other than ours which are correct and yield results as our hypotheses do. In other words, this statement is correct if it can be proved that it solely refers to this hypothesis. To cite an example, was the hypothesis of Ptolemy on heavenly bodies not yielding results? Of course it was. They used to tell themselves thus, If the earth is at the center, the sun revolves around the earth. The sun's movement follows the empyrean. The moon follows the lunar orbit. The lunar sphere, the solar sphere, and the empyrean have such movements in such and such a night. Then, a lunar eclipse will occur at such and such a time, and it really will happen. Were the classical astronomers not accurately predicting the occurrences of lunar and solar eclipses on the basis of these Ptolemaic views? Even now, in spite knowing that the hypothesis of Ptolemy was wrong, many scholars, since they do not know the Copernican hypothesis, or it is more complicated for them, calculate the occurrences of lunar and solar eclipses on the basis of the incorrect Ptolemaic system, yet they also yield correct results. Why? It is because if the Earth is at the center and the Sun revolves around the Earth, an eclipse must happen in such and such time and horizon. 
And if the sun is at the center and the earth revolves around the earth, an eclipse must also happen on the same time and horizon. That is, if this hypothesis is correct, there must be an eclipse at that time. And if the second hypothesis is also correct, there must also be an eclipse at that time. So, if I experienced one of these hypotheses and I found out that it yielded a correct result, this does not mean that my hypothesis is correct because the other hypothesis also yields the same result. Two other examples. Classical medicine was based upon the hypothesis of four elements, water, fire, air, and earth. The four temperaments, humidity, aridity, heat, and cold, and the four humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. Today's medicine recognizes none of them. The four elements, the four temperaments, or the four humors, none of them. According to modern science, it has been proven that none of them is correct. Was classical medicine not treating patients on the basis of its wrong hypothesis? Were the classical physicians not really able to cure even a single patient? Were they not able to find cure for typhoid fever? Was Abu Ali ibn Sina not able to treat the sick? In fact, it can be said that in some ailments, such as diphtheria, whose antidotes have just recently been discovered, classical medicine had been more successful than modern medicine in practice. That is, they used to arrive at a correct conclusion on the basis of the same wrong hypothesis. Thus, to say, if the hypothesis is correct, the correct conclusion will be reached. It is correct. But if you say, if the hypothesis arrives at the correct conclusion, definitely this hypothesis is correct, then this is wrong. Perhaps a wrong hypothesis arrives at the conclusion, which can also be reached by a correct hypothesis. Let me cite another example. A train with the speed of 50 miles per hour moves from Tehran to Mashhad and another train with a speed of 100 miles per hour moves from Mashhad to Tehran. Someone makes the following prediction. These trains which travel on the same line and are not aware of the existence of each other will collide at exactly such and such time. Incidentally, the case is the opposite. The train which moves from Tehran to Mashhad has a speed of 100 miles per hour, while the train which moves from Mashhad to Tehran has a speed of 50 miles per hour. Now, the hypothesis of this person who says that the train from Tehran with the speed of 50 miles per hour and the train from Mashhad with the speed of 100 miles per hour will have a collision, say at 8 o'clock evening, is not correct. But this prediction that the two trains will collide at exactly such and such time is correct. Why? This is because two hypotheses, one is correct while the other is wrong, may possibly arrive at the correct conclusion. Hence, we accept the phrase that correct hypothesis arrives at the correct conclusion. Of course, even this is not true in some cases. Yet the statement, whatever arrives at the correct conclusion has a correct hypothesis, has no proof. It is here that the so-called petitio principi, or begging the question, is committed. As Russell reaches this point, he says, I say, if this hypothesis of mine is correct, it will arrive at the conclusion. And I will then say, it arrived at the conclusion. Therefore, my hypothesis is correct. This statement of mine is correct if there is no other hypothesis apart from mine. I have to know that I know no other hypothesis here except one. And I can never know that there is only one hypothesis. It is here that from this perspective, this logic reaches an impasse. There are other questions regarding the relationship between knowledge and action. Since we have reached this point, it is inexpedient to deal with them only in the future sessions. One question is this, is action the key to knowledge? The criterion for knowledge is one thing, while the key to knowledge is another. There is another very serious question here. This question is one of the salient features of Hegelian and post-Hegelian philosophy, and is discussed particularly in Marxism. They say, those who have the right to express views on issues, social issues in particular, are only those who are actually socially involved. Those who are not involved have no right to express views. Those who are comfortably sitting in ivory towers have no right to express their views concerning social issues. Only those who come from the lower floors, 
who have joined the society and mingled with people have the right to express views. According to Marxism, for instance, a worker who is well versed with society and societal activities has better knowledge than a philosopher of the rank and prestige of Bertrand Russell, who would just sit inside his palace and come to the university's podium and express his views. Then, we shall compare this question with the more important question on the relationship between knowledge and action in Islam, that knowledge bestows action to man, and also in cases when, except through action, man cannot acquire knowledge. I suppose that this question is very interesting. That is, as I have said in the previous session, it is here that all the serious differences that exist between Marxism and Islam occur. On other issues, they are very close to one another but they will have to part ways again. I will also discuss it to you in the next session, God willingly. And with that being said, may God's salutations be upon Muhammad and his pure progeny. End of chapter 9